Due Process, recipient of six Mid-Atlantic Emmy Awards. We have a democratic system for holding people to account. It is a system that is admired worldwide. But who will be held accountable for the U.S. abuse of Iraqi prisoners here? And what about the long-term cost to America's image abroad? Shock and anger, the emotional response to photos like these, the legal response yet to come. Military law, international law, and the outrage at Abu Ghraib, up next on this edition of Due Process. Major funding for Due Process is made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding is provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual. Images from Abu Ghraib have already been imprinted, maybe indelibly, on our national psyche. But what do those grotesque photos tell us about our nation, our military, ourselves? What law governs abuse of prisoners in Iraq? Just who is likely to be called to task for the acts of humiliation, of torture, which the whole world has now seen? And maybe most important, how will this country live down those images so at odds with the values we profess? I'm Sandra King, and if you're a regular viewer of Due Process, you know I'm not in my usual spot. In fact, for this show, Raymond Brown and I have changed seats. Today, Raymond's here not to ask the questions, but to answer them. And he's one of three guests eminently qualified to help us sort through a complex set of moral, practical, and legal issues. Who better to give us some insight on it all than these three guests? Former U.S. District Judge Stephen Orlovsky at this time last year was in Iraq as part of a 13-member state and Justice Department mission sent to help build a new court system there. Retired Brigadier General Richard O'Meara with us from Newark was a JAG officer with expertise in international legal studies. Now he teaches political science at Kane and Monmouth Universities. And though you may know him as a criminal defense attorney as well as host of Due Process, Raymond, too, brings years of lecturing, teaching, and writing on international law. In fact, he is now working on a war crimes case in Sierra Leone. Gentlemen, welcome to all of you. Uh, Judge Orlovsky, Stephen, let me start with you. Uh, this time last year, you're in Iraq, there with an assessment team, trying to bring order to a legal system that was obviously in chaos. Ironically, one of the recommendations that came out of your panel was no torture and the right to remain silent. The images that we've been assaulted with in these last two, three weeks, have they undermined everything that you were there to do? Well, I think they certainly have eroded a great deal of what we attempted to do, or what the United States professed it wanted to do, and, uh, and that was to reestablish the rule of law in Iraq. Um, I think that this has had this. This will have an unerasable effect on our ability to restore confidence in the Iraqi uh, people about whether we can administer justice in an even-handed way, and what our real motives are for being in Iraq. We had hailed ourselves in Iraq as liberators and not conquerors, and unfortunately, these images are going to make many of the Iraqi people feel that we are there as conquerors and that in some ways were no different than Saddam. You were there, what you saw? Do these photographs reflect the images that you picked up while you were there, the sense you had? I didn't, I was there at a very early time. I didn't have that sense. I did have an opportunity to visit some pretrial detention centers uh, which were being supervised by our military. Uh, I didn't have the sense that that kind of conduct was going on, the troops, 
um, that I observed appeared to be well-trained and well-schooled, and more importantly, well-led and well-supervised with respect to the law of land warfare and, and the Geneva Convention, and I certainly didn't observe any uh, mistreatment of, of Iraqi uh, uh, prisoners or pretrial detainees. We'll talk more about the rule of law, but let me ask you, General, about the law of war. Um, I think that for many of us who've not been there, not seen it, we have a sense that it's all chaos and violence anyway. And yet there is, or is there, a code, a law. Um, and, and how surprised should we be when things go awry as they apparently have at Oba Grape? I think there are two issues with regard to that. First, first of all, uh, the major excuse that people come up with routinely with regard to violations of the law of war, etc., is that there is, quote, the fog of war, and quote, and further that war is chaos. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth in terms of our legal and, and moral standards, uh, certainly in the military. Uh, the military pays a great deal of attention to making sure that chaos does not cause thugs the ability to do the kinds of things that we apparently have seen in these photographs. Uh, there's a, a, an entire military system set up uh, to detect and to, uh, and to punish these kinds of violations. Sometimes it doesn't work, obviously. So when there's a breakdown like there apparently has been here, do we assume that, in fact, there have been orders from on high, or do we assume that there has just been no supervision, as others have claimed? Well, on a, on a show that deals with the law, I think the word assumes a scary word to use. And what we do is we look for proof and we, uh, and we make decisions based upon the facts. At the present time, uh, I will not assume that uh, there are uh, orders from on high uh, requiring these individuals to do these kinds of acts. Frankly, uh, unofficially, I assume the opposite. Uh, but we won't know until the investigations are done and the people go to trial and uh, testimony is taken. Raymond, Judge Orlovsky mentions the Geneva Conventions. It's something we've been hearing about in these last few weeks, and yet most of us have very little idea about what they govern, what they mean. In Iraq, do they apply? After all, this is not a traditional POW camp. What are we looking at here? Well, the laws of war actually have many, have deep roots historically and otherwise. Specifically, the Geneva Convention applies in a couple of ways. After World War II, the Geneva Conventions, which were originally drafted in 1863, were redrafted because of what had happened under German and Japanese occupation. And so one aspect covered by the Geneva Conventions are what obligations are imposed on an occupying power. That's why after some initial reluctance, the administration had to admit we were an occupying power. But the other is that the other thing that happened after World War II was an attempt to go back and look again at how the laws of war that the general referred to are designed to present, protect both civilians and other non-combatants, including enemies who've been captured and made prisoners. So there is a well-settled body of law to which the United States has long subscribed, and indeed some of the criticism that has suggested that what's happened in Abu Ghraib, if the pictures are accurate, is the result of conversation by this administration have to do with the fact that when Guantanamo was first opened, uh, Donald Rumsfeld began to talk about the Geneva Convention not applying to opposition from within the Pentagon and within the State Department. And although ultimately the United States said it would use the Geneva Convention at Guantanamo, that has opened up a chasm and a controversial one which continues and perhaps affects what happened at Abu Ghraib. So it's not just, Raymond, a matter of uh, American conscience, sense of morality, but in fact law that governs here, and how does that law impact on, in a practical way? Well, that's why it's so important at a time when the United States is seeking international assistance in Iraq, when there is an entire Mideast initiative by which the U.S. says it hopes to bring democracy and the rule of law to the Mideast, whether the U.S. is seen as upholding the rule of law or using it cynically and manipulating it is very important. One other thing that ties this to the Geneva Convention is during the Vietnam War, there was an incident called My Lai, and it involved 500 civilians being killed during an incident which resulted in a court-martial for a lieutenant uh, who was convicted and a captain acquitted. After that incident, a report was written by General Pierce, and in it he criticized the United States for not training its soldiers with respect to their obligations under the Geneva Convention. Now we have a report by General Taguba, what, 30 years later, talking about the fact that at least the 800th Brigade was not, not trained properly with respect to the Geneva Convention. And all of that's seen by the world because these are common rules that apply to all nations. And I think we've all been thinking about Milai 
in these last weeks. Um, Stephen, you were in Vietnam, and I I'm wondering how the images that we've been watching have reverberated for you, and if they take you back to those years. Well, some of the some of the the images from the Vietnam War that will never be removed from the collective psyche of the American people are those photographs of the South Vietnamese general shooting a prisoner in the head and the young Vietnamese girl who is uh, fleeing naked fleeing a bombing attack and then of course the scenes of the of the murders at My Lai. These images that we've currently seen which have come out of Iraq are going to have that same kind of uh, indelible uh, effect on our collective psyches and more importantly what I what 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 is going to happen is that when we met my team and I teammates and I met with Iraqi judges and Iraqi lawyers we had in their view a legal system uh, which was the envy of the wo of the world that it was fair and impartial the Iraqi judicial system during the Saddam regime was widely viewed by by lawyers who practiced in it and by the Iraqi people as corrupt and unfair and um, many of the people lawyers whom I met when I was in Iraq were so glad we were there because we could help reestablish a legal system that was fair and impartial and just and these images however the investigations turn out uh, are simply going to set us back not only in the, in the eyes of the Iraqi people but in the, in the eyes of the people of the Middle East and, and the people of the world. Richard, do you agree with, um, with the judge? Do you think that those images will last the way that those Vietnam images have? Well, I can tell you from personal experience. Uh, I was a, uh, an infantry uh, second lieutenant in Vietnam, uh, and I was also, uh, I took some students back to My Lai myself uh, a few years ago and gave them, if you will, the history of, 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 of My Lai as well. And I've given that same speech with regard to My Lai to soldiers for 30 years, including soldiers of the 800th MP Brigade, by the way. And the, and the, and the image, uh, the, the discussion that I have is aside from the fact that the rules are there, the rules are taught, uh, the, the, the issue is not merely, the, merely, and I don't mean that the wrong way, uh, the injustice that's done to the victims, but the fact that for the rest of your life, soldiers, you will be dealing with the crimes that you commit. Don't think these things are condoned by anyone at any time. So these images you think will live? Unfortunately, they will. And Sandy, the, the, the nuance here is very interesting because there's sometimes a tendency to stereotype in a negative way the military mind or the military as an institution. But, for example, I go back to uh, Donald Rumsfeld's negative comments about the Geneva Convention were met with criticism from military personnel. In the case that's been argued before the Supreme Court about the prisoners at Guantanamo, many military organizations and POW groups joined and filed briefs against the government's position saying there should be more protections at Guantanamo because there is this question that if you don't protect other troops and other persons who are captured when, and are in the custody of the United States, what happens to U.S. personnel? What risks do they run if when could, they are captured by other forces? If I could interrupt for a second. Uh, my, my second point is it's, it seems to me in this discussion it's real important to differentiate between the political uh, issues both internationally and domestically and the legal issues. Uh, the second thing that will come up certainly uh, came up in the Milai case and will come up in the uh, uh, in these trials often is I was only following orders, it's an orders defense, legally it doesn't That's exist. That's the crux of it, right. But we will, we will hear that a lot. Uh, indeed that will be the sympathetic defense uh, that will be used in the newspapers. I'm a young person, I was only following orders, I have no uh, duty to disobey orders and indeed soldiers are taught exactly the opposite with regard to these kinds of this kind of conduct. Uh, the problem with that is uh, obviously it's a moral conundrum that, that soldiers are put in but but it's a legal one uh, but the second issue is that this type of conduct taints all the other soldiers who are indeed doing the right thing. I, I, for the rest of my life, for example, having been an infantry second lieutenant, have been tainted with Lieutenant Cowley's crimes. Indeed, I, I to this day, am emotional about uh, this individual and the things he said at his court martial, because frankly, as far as I'm concerned, he's a criminal and a thug. He knew better, and he, and he, uh, and he killed a lot of people for no reason. Uh, We've already heard um, on a CBS interview from uh, Lindy Ireland, who's one of the young women, the one who was most 
uh, pictured in those images doing some of the most horrendous things, that she was under, she claims, express orders. She was told, and not just by uh, intelligence personnel from the military, but by civilian contractors working on intelligence in Iraq, that this was what she was supposed to do. And the more brutal and the more outrageous her conduct, the more she was told, yeah, you, you've got it. That's the right thing. Um, react, if you will, um, Steve, to, to what the general just told us about this excuse of just following orders. Obviously not a new excuse. Well, it is, it's the same defense that was offered at the Nuremberg trials by the Nazis who were indicted. Uh, we rejected that defense there. Uh, as General O'Meara has pointed out, part of the training that every soldier is supposed to receive is training in the law of war and that every soldier knows that he or she cannot simply justify a crime by saying that I was simply following orders. Our, our troops are instructed on the law of war, and they know what what war crimes are. I can't imagine that anyone uh, can say with a straight face that unloosing a dog on on a naked prisoner is not a crime, uh, and that it can be justified by any any order by no matter what the source of the order may have been. Now, there's a there's a, a slightly different um, dynamic here because the defense is saying that not only were these orders uh, given either in, a, in an express way or an implied way by the military chain of command, but that civilian contractors were somehow involved and other government agencies were somehow involved uh, in this as well. That's, that's something new. But regardless of the source of the order, assuming such an order were given, it's something that we cannot accept or countenance. And those who follow those orders and those who gave them have to be punished and brought to account. Raymond, your reaction to the, 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 the Lindy England uh, defense? Well, two parts. The first is I agree with the judge and the general that following orders is not a defense. And I also, you know, believe in the presumption of innocence for everyone. But if the enlisted personnel continuously say they were following orders at some point, or if they merely ran amok in a continuous fashion, the question of command responsibility is raised. That is, who up the chain of command was responsible, and will this investigation thoroughly and, fail and fairly evaluate those questions which have such deep implications? Which leads us to wonder why, at least at this point in the investigation, we have low-level people charged and we have officers reprimanded to the, the, the American who looks at the newspaper and says, what's going on? How, how would you answer that? Well, I don't think the investigation can stop at the low-level sergeant or private. Um, I think it has to go, proceed up the chain of command. There was a brigadier general, General Karpinski, who commanded this military Who brigade. says she's being scapegoated. Well, uh, that, with all due respect, that's something that she'll have an opportunity to present at her trial, assuming she is charged with a crime. And as Raymond says, there is a presumption of innocence, and th this matter is still under investigation. But I think that the investigation has to go all the way up the chain of command. And the Torguba report is is very reminiscent of the Pierce report, which was which was prepared after the My Lai massacre. Um, and what the Torguba report says, and it's a matter of public record is that there was a failure of leadership, a failure to supervise, a failure to train, uh, and these are things that military officers are trained to do. They, they are trained to know that everything that happens or fails to happen on their watch is their responsibility. I wonder, uh, Richard, if you think that we'll see court-martial for the um, higher level people in command and how high you think that's likely to go. And how fair a trial you think that anyone uh, in this case can get, uh, given the, the problems of command influence and, and um, you know better than I how that can impact? Well, I don't think there are going to be any problems of command influence, frankly. Uh, uh, the military has a number of walls that have been set up uh, precisely to combat what, is a, what can be an obvious problem over the course of time, but, but rarely is anymore. There, there may be. We'll have to see as we go. You've really asked me three separate questions. First of all, it's, all. It's, first of all it's, it's important to remember that the, the Takuba report, and I watched his testimony the other day, uh, he made it very clear. He, he really only investigated from the brigade down, from General Karpinski down. 
And his purpose was not to do a criminal investigation. His purpose was to determine whether there were systemic problems that could have caused the culture and the climate to be such as it was, which is very useful to make changes, but doesn't impact specifically on the criminal aspects of this case. Uh, so that leaves open two separate issues. Number one is, are there other issues above General Karpinski's command level uh, which uh, need to be looked at? And, and secondly, uh, is there something in the Taguba report that's helpful to the, to the criminal trials? Uh, it occurs to me that it's not inappropriate to start with the people who indeed, apparently, again, innocence uh, being what it is, uh, uh, were in the picture, certainly, and may have been the assaulters. So uh, they're the, the, the first uh, issue. Obviously, they're the, uh, uh, the, uh, the junior people. They're the people that were doing the work. Uh, the, there will be criminal investigations. I'm certainly certain there are right now with regard to uh, senior level people, certainly uh, uh, a number of the people involved in the MI level. We haven't heard too much about them, military intelligence level yet, and uh, up the chain of command on the uh, military police level as well. I think it will go a little bit higher. That doesn't mean to say uh, that there will be uh, criminal trials with regard to the, these individuals. I don't know. That, that you know, uh, the, the future abides the facts as they come out in the investigations. You but feel confident this will be a fair and honest investigation and that the chips will fall where they may? I believe it will. I, sir, I, I do believe it will. Uh, there, uh, uh, for any number of reasons. Number one is because the systems are set up to do it that way. And number two, uh, and, and this is true in every bureaucracy, whether it's Department of Justice or uh, Department of Immigration, when the light is on the bureaucracy, it tends to function perfectly. Uh, I expect that's going to occur here. Raymond, you have the same assumption? I'm perhaps a little more cynical. I mean, I hope that fairness and justice prevail. That's critical. But there is so much at stake for the nation and so much pressure that it's hard to see that people will not be aware of how their actions are going to be viewed in the future. And that one of the, the lingering, at least, critiques of what happened at Milai was that there were higher echelon commanders over the, the site of Milai in helicopters who were not charged. One, to be fair, died, and there was controversy about it. But there has to be both justice, and people have to be satisfied that there really was justice. There, there are, if I can interrupt, there, there are extremely sophisticated and different sets of issues uh, involved. And, and I'm not, I'm not trying to dissuade anyone that there shouldn't be investigations up the chain. But one set of issues is creating a, quote, climate, if you will, that's, that's inappropriate and causes these things. Very serious from a command point of view. Uh, the second set is actually telling people to go do criminal acts. Uh, they're, they're really kind of separate, although uh, in a, on occasion they have the same results. But it's a fairly sophisticated difference. And, you know, there, um, there are people who believe that the climate was established in Washington and um, that Donald Rumsfeld himself may have set a, a climate with what he wanted to do in Guantanamo. I have to say, I, as, a, as a former private and corporal and sergeant E5 and as a former lieutenant, I rarely recall ever concerning myself with what was going on in Washington, D.C. Uh, on the other, uh, you did mention Sierra Leone. I just want to mention the context of international law, which, uh, which the United States has helped make. In fact, the first modern code of the laws of war came from the United States. Um, the fact is the man I represent in Sierra Leone is charged by virtue of a theory of command responsibility for troops either under his command that he either knew were doing wrong by allegation or he should have known which are fairly well-tested notions. So the, 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 the net can sweep broadly, but as the general points out, it has to be fair. Steve, you signed on to one of the, the briefs in the Guantanamo case. I did. Um, what do you think about the claim that there's been a disdain for international law and, and, and basic fairness, and that perhaps um, that led to this environment? Well, I think that, and, and I agree with the general, having been a lieutenant and a captain, that I rarely concerned myself with what the Secretary of Defense was saying. I frankly didn't have an opportunity to read it or observe it on television. Uh, but I think that um, a certain atmosphere can be created at the top. I think clearly, in my view anyway, Secretary Rumsfeld has intimidated many of the senior officers at the Pentagon. Um, things have happened, for example, with respect to how, much, how many troops we were going to need to occupy Iraq. Originally, General Sinsenki, who has since retired, said we were going to need two or three hundred thousand dollars. Excuse me, two hundred, two hundred to three hundred thousand troops to occupy Iraq, and he and General and Secretary Rumsfeld just blew that away. We've got about thirty seconds left. Um, 
understanding there's so much more to talk about here, let me just ask you, all three of you, for a quick assessment. When we meet a year from now, will we see that those images are influencing American politics and international politics? I think that those images are going to influence American politics and international politics. Richard? I am hopeful that the, uh, the prosecutions that occur will demonstrate, if they're transparent enough, that we do have the justice system we, uh, we advertise. Raymond, quickly. International politics, yes. Uh, uh, domestic politics, the American people have an American, amazing sense of amnesia. My sincere thanks to Raymond, Steve Orlovsky, uh, Richard O'Meara, and Raymond will be back in the seat next week for another serious look at law and justice issues. Until then, for Raymond Brown and all of us here at Due Process, I'm Sandra King. Thanks for watching. It takes time for reports to be finished, uh, correction to be gathered. This is a very comprehensive report. The Acting Secretary of the Army has also directed a complete assessment of the Army's internment, detention, inter and interrogation policies, practices, and procedures. Now, why were we not told in a classified briefing why this happened and that it happened at all? It's a uh, neglect of the responsibilities that Secretary Rumsfeld and the civilian leaders of the Pentagon have to keep the Congress informed of an issue of this magnitude. We have a democratic system for holding people to account. It is a system that is admired worldwide. And the president will make certain that people are held to account. Major funding for due process was made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding was provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual. Looking at me? Where do you want him to look at? At the camera. At the camera? Hmm. This is your intro shot. So I'm saying how brilliant you are and how well informed on every subject. But we know that's subject. a lie, a canard. <laughs> but, uh, I Don't smile. Okay, so here we are. So don't look so mournful. So don't smile. And look back. Don't, don't talk. Look at me and then look back. And look back. And look at me now. Look at Sandy, please. And look back. <laughs>